If you've got to this point, then there is the third challenge of natural selection. Things change. You know, you know that natural selection applies to ideas, to organizations, and that's a challenge as well. Maybe the Neuralink solution of people becoming part AI will be one way we will choose to address this. I claim that to get this conviction, that to believe that large neural networks can do amazing things, you need to have two beliefs. One of the belief, one of the beliefs is a little bit harder to get to. The other one is easier. So the easy belief is that the human brain is big. The human brain is big and the brain of a cat is smaller and the brain of an insect is smaller still. And we correspondingly see that humans can do things which cats cannot do and so on. That's easy. The hard part is to kind of say, well, maybe an artificial neuron, the kind, the kind of neurons that we have in artificial neural networks, is not that different from a biological neuron as far as the essential information processing is concerned. So in other words, of course, the, the, the biological neuron is very complicated and it does so many different things. But when it comes down to it, you have signals in, signal out, maybe it's a pretty not maybe you can explain a lot with a pretty simple artificial neuron. And if you just allow yourself to say, yeah, yeah, they're different, yeah, yeah, biological neurons are more complex, but let's just say, suppose they're similar enough. Then you say, yeah, okay, we now have an existence proof that large neural nets, all of us, can do all these amazing things. So the existence is there. Can we then somehow make it so? For that, we need to be able to train. But if you, that's the kind of chain of reasoning which, you know, in the environment of my, you know, when I was in graduate school with Jeff, I think it was, we were thinking about neural nets, it was perhaps more possible, more feasible to make this realization than it would have been elsewhere. So at OpenAI, we have a document which we call the OpenAI Charter, which outlines the goal of OpenAI. And there we offer a definition of AGI. And we say that an AGI is a computer system which can automate the great majority of intellectual labor. That's one useful definition. Mm -hmm. In some sense, an AGI would be the intuition there is that it's a computer that's as smart as a person. So you might, for example, have a coworker mm -hmm. that's a computer. So that would be a, defi a definition of AGI, which I think is intuitively satisfying. The term is a bit ambiguous because AGI, the G means general. So it's a generality that we want, that we care about in the AGI. But it's actually a bit more than generality. We care about generality and competence. It needs to be general in the sense that it can respond sensibly when you throw things at it, but it needs to be competent so that when you invent, when it does something, you ask it a question or ask it to do something, it will do it. You know, I won't be overly specific in my answer to this question, <laughs> but I will say that I think that, you know, I'll comment on the second part of the question, is, is, is Transformers all we need? And I think that the question is a bit wrong because it implies something binary. It implies transformers are, are either good enough or not good enough. Mm -hmm. But I think it's better to think about it in terms of tax, where we have transformers and they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could have something better that would be maybe more efficient or maybe will be faster. But we, as we know, when you make the transformers large, they still become better. Mm -hmm. They might just become, be, might be becoming better more slowly. So while I am totally sure that it will be possible to improve very significantly on the, on the current architectures that we have, even if we didn't, we would be able to go extremely far. I would argue that with a few, if we made a few simple modifications to the LSTM, their hidden states are quite small if you somehow made it larger. 
and then we were to go through the trouble of figuring out how to train them. Because LSTMs are recurrent neural networks, and we kind of forgot about them. We haven't put in the effort to, because you know how neural net training works. You have the hyperparameters. Well, how do you set them? It's like, you don't know. How do you set your learning rates? If it doesn't learn, can you explain why? And so this kind of work has not been done for LSTMs. So that's why our ability to train them is more reduced. Mm -hmm. But had we done that work so that we were able to train the LSTMs and we just did some simple things to increase their hidden state size, I think they would be worse than transformers, but we would still be able to go extremely far with them also. What the scaling law tells you it uh, relates, it's a relationship between the inputs that you put into the neural network and some kind of a simple to measure performance, me sim simple to evaluate performance measure like your next word prediction accuracy. Mm -hmm. And that relationship is very strong. But what is tr challenging is that we don't really care about next word prediction. We care about it indirectly. We care about the other incidental benefits that we get out of it. And, our, and so, our, so for example, you all know that if you predict the next word accurately enough, you get all kinds of interesting emergent properties. Those have been quite hard to predict, or at least I'll say I'm not aware of such work. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is looking for interesting research work pro problems to work on, that would be one. I will say, I will mention one example, something that we've done at OpenAI in our, in, in, in our run up to GPT-4, where we tried to do a scaling law for a more interesting task, which is predicting accuracy at solving coding problems. Mm -hmm. We were able to do that accurately, very accurately, and that's a pretty good thing, because this is a more tangible metric. It's not, it's still, it's, a, it's an improvement over next step, next word prediction accuracy as far as things that are relevant to us. So in other words, it's more relevant to us to know what the coding accuracy is going to be, ability to solve coding problems, compared to just ability to predict the next word. It still doesn't answer the really important question of can you predict some emergent behavior that you haven't seen before. I think maybe the big surprise for me is You know, it may, it may sound a little odd, probably to most people in this audience, but the big surprise for me is that neural networks work at all. <laughs> because when I was starting my work in this area, they didn't work. Or it was like, let's define what it means to work at all. It means they could do, they could work a little bit, but not really, not in any serious way, not in a way that anyone except for the most intense enthusiasts would care about. And so now we see, yeah, like those neural nets work. So I guess the artificial neuron really is at least somewhat related to the biological neuron, or at least that basic assumption has been validated to some degree. The human brain can do those things, it's true. But does it follow that our training process yeah. will produce something exactly. similar? Yeah. So, def so it was definitely very amazing. I think, yeah, seeing, seeing the coding ability improved quickly. That was quite, quite a sight to be seen. And for coding in particular, because you know, it went from no one has ever seen a computer code anything at all ever. There was a little area of computer science called program synthesis, mm -hmm. which maybe it was very niche. And it was very niche because they couldn't have any accomplishments. Yeah. It was a very, they had a very difficult experience. And then these neural nets came in and said, oh yeah, code synthesis, like, we're gonna do, we're gonna accomplish what you hope, were hoping to achieve one day, like tomorrow. So that was, yeah, deep learning. So let's take a step back and talk about the state of the world. So, you know, you've had this AI research happening and it was exciting and now you have the GPT models and now you all get to play with all the different chatbot and assistants and, you know, Bard and mm -hmm. chat GPT and you say, okay, that's pretty cool. It can do things. And indeed, they already are 
you can start perhaps worrying about the implications of the tools that we have today. And I think that it is a very valid thing to do. But that's not where I allocate my concern. Mm -hmm. The place where things get really tricky is when you imagine fast forward in some number of years, a decade, let's say. How powerful will AI be? Of course, with this incredible future power of AI, which I think will be difficult to imagine, frankly. With an AI this powerful, you could do incredible, amazing things that are perhaps even outside of our dreams. Like if you can really have a dramatically powerful AI. But the place where things get challenging are directly connected to the power of the AI. It is powerful. It is going to be extremely unbelievable, un unbelievably powerful. And it is because of this power that's where the safety issues come up. And I'll mention three, I, I personally see three, like, you know, when, when you get, so you, met, you alluded to the letter mm -hmm. that uh, we posted at OpenAI a few days ago, actually yesterday. About, what we th about some ideas that we think would be good to implement to navigate the challenges of superintelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, what is superintelligence? Why did we choose to use the term superintelligence? The reason is that superintelligence is meant to convey something that's not just like an AGI. With AGI, we said, well, you have something kind of like a person, kind of like a coworker. Superintelligence is meant to convey something far more capable than that. Mm -hmm. When you have such a capability, it's like, can we even imagine how it will be? But without question, it's going to be unbelievably powerful. It could be used to solve incomprehensibly hard problems if it is used well, if we navigate the challenges that superintelligence pose, poses. We could, we could radically improve the quality of life. But the power of superintelligence is so vast. So the concerns. The concern number one has been expressed a lot, and this is the scientific problem of alignment. Mm -hmm. You might want to think of it from the, as, an, as an analog to nuclear safety. You know, you build a nuclear reactor. You want to get the energy. You need to make sure that it won't melt down, even if there's an earthquake, and even if someone tries to, I don't know, smash a truck into it. Yep. So this is the superintelligence safety, and it must be addressed in order to contain the vast power of the superintelligence. This is called the alignment problem. One of the suggestions that we had in, our, in the post was an approach that an international organization could do to create various standards at this very high level of capability. And I want to make this other point you know, about the post and also about um, our CEO, Sam Altman, congressional testimony where he advocated for regulation of AI. The intention is primarily to put rules and standards of various kinds on the very high level of capability. You know, you could maybe start looking at GPT-4, but that's not really what is interesting, mm -hmm. what is relevant here, but something which is vastly more powerful than that. When you have a technology so powerful, it becomes obvious that you need to do something about this power. So that's the first concern, the first challenge to overcome. The second challenge to overcome is that, of course, we are people, we are humans, humans of interests. Mm -hmm. And if you have super intelligence is controlled by people, well, who knows what's going to happen. I do hope that at this point, we will have the super intelligence itself try to help us solve the challenge in the world that it creates. This is not, no longer an unreasonable thing to say. Like if you imagine a super intelligence that indeed sees things more deeply than we do, much more deeply, to understand reality better than us, we could use it to help us solve the challenges that it creates. Then there is the third challenge, which is the challenge maybe of natural selection. You know what the Buddhists say, that change is the only constant. So even if you do have your super intelligences in the world and they are all, we've managed to solve alignment, we managed to solve, no one wants to use them in very destructive ways. We managed to create a life of unbelievable abundance 
which really like not just not just material abundance but health longevity yeah. like all the things we don't even try dreaming about because they're so obviously impossible if you've got to this point then there is the third challenge of natural selection things change you know you know that natural selection applies to ideas to organizations mm -hmm. and that's a challenge as well maybe the neural link solution of people becoming part AI will be one way we will choose to address this. I don't know. But I would say that this kind of describes my concern. And specifically, just as the concerns are big, if you manage, man, it is so worthwhile to overcome them. Because then we could create truly unbelievable lives for ourselves that are completely even unimaginable. So it is, it is like a challenge that's really, really worth overcoming.